So I started to join the Academy, I believe it was in 1987, at the request of Tom Hackett and Ned Kassam, who were some of my mentors at the Mass General Hospital. And Tom was in the leadership track of the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine, as it was then called, and he encouraged me to join the organization as a wonderful home for a budding consultation liaison psychiatrist. So when I joined the Academy in 1987, it was a small club or guild. There were about 125 members. Most of the people attended the organization, and everybody could fit in one not very large room. Joining the Academy, staying in the Academy, attending the annual meetings, for me has been one of the most remarkable aspects of my professional career. Uh, the only meeting that I attend on a regular basis and have attended for uh, more than 35 years uh, is the APM, now the ACLP meeting, whereas I found that to be a place where people of like minds and like activities and professional interests could gather, could talk, not just about the work, but their families and what they do and what they enjoy from life. And I look forward to the annual meeting each and every year and to the social and interpersonal aspects that come with it, including playing golf with people like Don Rosenstein and John Schuster. So the benefits of joining the Academy professionally have been to get a constant stream of stimulation of ideas and content that help me frame and formulate what I do, how I communicate with other people, how I can educate and mentor others, and build the work of the field to try to educate people within our discipline, across disciplines, so that everybody learns our perspective on approaching problems and thereby taking care of better care of patients. Well, it's nice to be thought of as a mentor and having that gift of transmittal of information to others uh, be valued. I've always been an obligate mentor that every opportunity that I see with patient discussions or clinical rounds or interactions at meeting is always an opportunity for me to see the what-ifs of the world. Not just what do I hear, what do I see, but what could it be and what could we do with it. So when I hear cases, just like I, when I hear discussions at meetings, I try not to listen just to what is said, but I try to figure out what wasn't said and why wasn't it said? And it's those aspects of the questions that are usually of more interest than the initial discussion. Because if I can figure out the things on the fringe, the things that we can associate to, then we can build knowledge in a way that isn't so linear. So mentorship is not a single thing. And most of the people that I know and have worked with don't benefit from the work of a single mentor. Most people use several different people for several different mentorship skills and opportunities. Some people teach the skills of academic growth, like learning how to speak more clearly, learning how to organize better, learning how to write succinctly and clearly and effectively and efficiently. There are all different skill sets that people can do. But there's also the mentorship of how do you use a national meeting to build your stature in the field, to make connections, to join committees, to build workshops or a symposium, to plan ahead for opportunities, to think when you're at a meeting for what you could do over the next year, 
And it's those relationships, not just at your home institution, which could be a small place or it could be a large place, but how you can build relationships across the country in your area of excellence and in areas that are one-off or close enough that you can make something happen. So those are great ways to frame what academic growth at meetings can do. So as I said, I try to look for the one-off, the questions that could be asked, but I also try to reframe what I hear and what I see and try to figure out what is it that's interesting about a presentation and to whom is it interesting. And if I can figure out the what's interesting and to whom it's interesting for, then we have an idea. And I read the nonverbal expressions of the people that surround me to figure out whether we have a win or we have a dud. If when I'm talking about a case or somebody else is talking about a case or a presentation and I see furrowed brows and little side to side head nods, we're going to have to do some more work. But if I get raised eyebrows, a little positive head nod, a little titubation tremor going on, then I know that we've got something. So I think about this in some ways, to paraphrase Woodward and Bernstein from All the President's Men and the Watergate Crisis, where a deep throat said, follow the money. I would paraphrase that to say, I try to follow the affect. And if I can get affective involvement about the questions, the problems, or the issue, that's the way I start to frame it. And then I build it by asking those tried and true questions that newspaper article writers have asked for decades or longer, which is who, what, where, when, why, and how. And for any topic, those are my organizing criteria, the pillars of knowledge. And if we can answer that, I think we've got a good story or narrative to build upon. As you've alluded to, part of the challenge is also getting to the affect and getting people engaged in it. And one of the things I value sometimes more highly than anything else is having fun in doing what I do. Not that the work is not serious or life-threatening or really challenging for many people that are facing people at the cusp of life and death. But we also have to maintain our emotional resilience and balance as we talk about the cases we're doing. So I try to follow the affect. I try to find the affect and to try to figure out what's interesting. And when people say it's a routine case or it's dull or boring, I know people are not looking deeply enough or they're looking too much directly at it and they're not using their emotional peripheral vision, if you will, because it's the things that are related to it that make all the difference. And if you can take the time to look at something slightly differently, you'll find something really interesting and challenging, whether it's biological, psychological, social, cultural, existential. All those levels are present in every single case that is presented at our rounds, though we don't always talk about all of those features at every case discussion, but they're all active. And that's why it's important not just to listen and look for what was said, what was presented, but what wasn't presented. And if you do that, you'll think differently about it. So I've often thought of that as an approach, just like the TV show CSI, the crime scene investigators. So if you were sitting in front of me, much like you are right now, and someone were to come by with a long machete, and slash you in the neck and give you a nice arterial spray on the wall next to you and behind you, 
but there was someone or something behind you, between you and the wall, there would be a void pattern on the wall. And the crime scene investigator would have to figure out what was between you, the victim, and the wall that's been sprayed with your blood. And it's that thought process that makes me smile and try to investigate the things that are related to it. It's, so it's not just what was the angle, how much blood did you lose, it's all the other things of what was missing and doing deductive reasoning to figure out what was behind it or behind you. So part of the reason why I infuse just about every one of my clinical rounds with television shows and movies is I watch an incredible amount of television and movies. <laughs> so it's always on the front of my brain. And then I try to find uh, not just the content of similarities, the stories and their similarities to make it a little bit more palatable because sometimes talking about your clinical work with patients is a little bit too close for people. But if you can put it on a screen and you can figure out how somebody did it on small screen or big screen, then people can think about it as well as feel it. And actors are often better at displaying the affect than are the patients or the presenters about the patients. And then we can have uh, a one-off discussion of the situation, whether it's receiving bad news or telling somebody something very personal or resolving acute grief or whatever it is. There's plenty of stuff in the media that can help us figure out what's going on with them or with others, and people can discuss it. It's just getting tougher to have most of the things that I've seen be familiar to the growing group of younger trainees because they've never seen The Twilight Zone with Rod Serling. Or they don't, they don't know what the movie Deer Hunter was about. So I would like not to have to explain the story because it's like when you have to explain a joke to somebody. It's not as funny. But if I can try to figure out as many things that they've seen, I tap into that visual or that sound or song and make that another source of stimulation. So I feel fortunate that I've never been driven by money. And I have always chosen the bulk of my projects because I was invested in the idea, the concept, the work, the collaboration, the mentorship, and helping somebody else achieve their goals. That enabled me to follow my interests and other people's interests rather than work so hard to get the cerebral presentation and get accepted by some other source. And if it works, that's great. If you're interested, the chance of it working is even better. The fact that it may take a lot of time has never bothered me in the slightest. Time has never been my enemy. Though as I get older, I realize there's less time ahead of me uh, than there is behind me. But fortunately, I have good genes and longevity uh, runs in my family. That being said, time is not the enemy. We follow our interests, and if you follow what you're interested in, you'll be in a good place. So it's been a great opportunity to have been selected as the editor-in-chief, a job that I've been doing for the last 12 years, and after the end of next year, 2020, I'll be stepping down as editor-in-chief, and that will give me 13 years as editor, with more years working as a reviewer and assistant editor on the journal before that. It gives me the opportunity of keeping updated on much of what happens in our field, especially 
with reference to consultation psychiatry, reviewing about 500 papers each year, and then editing the accepted manuscripts to help them be even more uh, acceptable um, and palatable to the readership of uh, our journal. That opportunity to constantly be stimulated by new material has been a real hoot. Um, I view myself as a lifelong learner. Uh, I learn, despite having seen more than 100,000 cases, reading and learning about the things that I see, there's always something with every case that I try and learn from. Um, and you can't get into a position where you think you know it all because you'll always be disappointed. Well, when I joined the organization in 1987 and joined the council uh, several years after that. I worked as a member of the council for close to 25 years. I'm no longer on the council or now called the board of directors, but it gave me the opportunity to see how people think, to see what people hope for, and to see how we can shape the vision of the organization to reach more and more people. And then it was more an organization of, by, and for consult psychiatrists. And my hope and expectation is that we'll continue to evolve, not just growing the numbers of consult psychiatrists, but that we will grow and be uh, a major figure in the field of interdisciplinary education because there are many more allied disciplines, whether it's psychology, behavioral health, and psychiatric nurse clinicians, and others who work with patients at the interface of psychiatric illness and comorbid medical and surgical illness. And I think we should grow into those fields, make the journal grow and expand to serve those audiences more. And then the sky is the limit because so many people in this country have comorbid medical and psychiatric illness. And nationwide, such a very tiny percentage of our patient population is served by people doing consultation work. So the amount of opportunity to reach and to help people who are suffering from their conditions is amazing. And the people who live in this country deserve more and better and better training about their conditions. So not only should the organization focus on the training and care of patients with comorbid illness, but we should increasingly educate the general population about these comorbid conditions so that they're better prepared as consumers and users of health care that comes by. And the more people know and understand the more choices they have, the better prepared they'll be to deal with the bad things in life that happen to all of us at some point. It's a great question. So the fear for many individuals who joined the academy in the 1980s and 90s was that if we grew as an organization, we would lose the personal feel that happened at a meeting that at its maximum used to be 125 people. Now we are right at the point where 1,200 people have attended this annual meeting in 2019. So a large growth in membership of the organization and in attendance at the annual meeting. What I think we've done is we've enabled people to have the ability to attend simultaneous sessions so you can still keep a smaller sense in a room so you can relate and interrelate in real-time active discussion, not just to hear a talking head give you a talk or a lecture and you absorb it. But when people use the principles of adult learning theory and you make it relevant to them, 
and you give people the opportunity to interact with the speakers and put their own views forward, then that engagement with the material and the people grows and builds the enthusiasm. Even our talks that used to be all 45 minutes to 60 minutes, I would say that's a dying art form and more and more of our presentations are going to the 20 to 30 minutes or the 12 to 15 minute sessions because people's attention span seemingly is shorter and shorter as the world learns differently with Google and podcasts and things that are much shorter. So if we can adapt with shorter presentations and if I mix my metaphors and use watering plants if you try and pour too much information to a dry plant and you pour it too quickly, the water will spill out onto the floor. But if you titrate how much you pour, you'll have a greater chance to have it absorbed, to be meaningful, to be valued. And I think education is much like plants. So maybe Chauncey Gardner, uh, to bring up another movie, uh, being there is uh, the right thing. So we need to titrate knowledge, make it meaningful, get it absorbed, have it be usable so that people can implement what they've learned and have it have that emotional valence. Give a word of advice, such as a word to people that are entering the field and trying to grow into this field, I would say find what's interesting about everything that you do and every person that you meet with. Try to figure out what affects they have and are evoked or stimulated within you. Follow the affect, much like the deep throat. Follow the money that we talked about before. And if you do that, you won't find that this is work, that this is an ongoing series of entertaining, though serious and powerful and meaningful events. And you'll get constant satisfaction. Hopefully you'll be in a situation like I've found myself in. I do not feel like what I do is work. Therefore, no matter how much time I spend doing it, it's still a hoot.